Here we are. Welcome, 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 everybody, to our How to Tech at Fringe workshop. This is definitely one of our favorite workshops because this is where all of the magic really happens. My name is Kevin. I am your Hollywood Fringe Programs Manager. I am a light-skinned man with um, a bit of an afro on my head, wearing a gray t-shirt or a sweatshirt with a, a white wall behind me. Um, so thank you everyone for coming here. I just want to start by letting everyone know that this, uh, and my pronouns are he, him as well. Um, I want to start this off by letting everyone know that this is being live streamed on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and I want to just acknowledge that so that everybody knows and you can make decisions that are best for you based off of that information. Um, during this time, if you need to take a break, feel free to do so whenever you need to. This is a casual space where we're here to learn and share information with experts that we have here with us today. Um, we'd love if you could also rename yourself on our Zoom with your first name and your pronouns, just so that we can make this a more inclusive and accessible place to end everybody that attends. And if you're having any accessibility needs at any point that aren't being met, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of our uh, fringe staff members who are here today. We have Ellen, myself, and Lois who are here, and they will we will accommodate you in the best way that we can. Also, if um, ahead of any event, if you need to request an interpreter interpreter for any event, please just email support at hollywoodfringe.org at least 72 hours in advance, and we will schedule an interpreter for you. Um, yeah, so uh, before we get started, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that um, we are on, the Hollywood Fringe acknowledges that we are on the unceded lands of the Tongva, Quiche, Gabrielinos, and Gabrielinos lands. Our statement serves as a practice as we commit to furthering our connection to the indigenous communities, past, present, and emerging. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and honors the indigenous peoples of the land that we currently reside on. And then now we'll move on into our upcoming events that are happening at Fringe because we are, it is April, which means in two months, we are gonna be in full Fringe mode, if not starting right now. We um, need to work. So buckle up and, and get ready to go. So- Sorry, our, sometimes I feel that. No. So we have tons of educational events on this year's schedule, all designed to prepare you for a successful fringe. And all of our events are listed on our blog page, which we're going to drop the link in the chat right now for. Um, new this year, we actually have a calendar, which is really exciting. So you can find directly and download all of our upcoming events at hollywoodfringe.org forward slash calendar. And again, that is going to be dropped in the chat here in just a moment. We also have our town halls. Town halls are hybrid and in-person live streamed and are all recorded for everybody to be able to watch back on YouTube. These are the informational sessions where Lois and Ellen, our two festival directors, will give you the download of everything that you need ahead of the fringe. We've had one already that we highly recommend you watch because it has a ton of really amazing information that'll help you have a smooth process. And you can find that recording on YouTube um, and all of our past workshops and town halls there as well. And we'll also have another one in just two weeks on April 15th. That one will be at the Hudson Theater as well as live streamed. Our workshops and panels are Zoom and live stream, like this one that we're doing here on how to check your fringe. And they're recorded on YouTube for later. Um, except for festival expectations, will, which will also be in person, but that one's also gonna be live streamed and uh, recorded for YouTube later. Um, and then all of our past workshops and town halls, like I said, will be available on YouTube. Um, we're, uh, we're, so far, we've done our one on accessibility, marketing, anti-racism, fundraising, budget, budgeting, and immersive. So you can check all of those out there and get all of the important information that you need. Um, and then we've also uh, had one of our virtual web sessions, which is also recorded on YouTube, um, if you can't tell. If you want to learn how to fringe and uh, just spend some time to immerse yourself in that, you can go to YouTube and find everything that you need. Um, our virtual web sessions are about how to navigate our platform and website pre-festival, 
and um, during festival. Our next one will be on May 2nd, which will focus on how to navigate the site during festival. This is for things like ticketing, messaging, will call. So make sure to come to that, um, that web session on May 2nd. And then if you haven't already seen the web session, go ahead and check that, on, that out on YouTube so that you can kind of get the download of how to function with the website and just take a little bit of stress off your, off your shoulders. Um, then uh, we also, this uh, last Wednesday, we started office hours again. And so we will be back every Wednesday at different fringe hotspots to network and socialize and um, just celebrate theater. Our next one is going to be this Wednesday, April 5th. It will be at the Broadwater from 7 o'clock until 10 o'clock. And it's just an amazing opportunity to meet fellow fringers, network, make friends, ask questions in person, and really start marketing your show. And we highly encourage participants to come to office hours because that is how we, um, uh, it's a huge part of the Hollywood fringe is, is the community that we form together. And that's where that community really starts. And for those of us who are out of town and can't make office hours, that's okay because we also have speed networking events that are coming up. Our first one is gonna be Thursday, 4.20 uh, from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. And then we'll have one on Monday, um, May 1st, 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. And Monday, uh, May 22nd, 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. And like I said, you can find all of this on our events blog and we will continue to send updates on our weekly newsletter. Once you register, you'll automatically be, be subscribed to the newsletter. So no worries um, if you're like, did I sign up for it? Did you register? If you did, then you're signed up for the newsletter. Uh, you can also subscribe on our website at hollywoodfringe.org in the top right-hand corner. Just click on the newsletter. And um, that's all of our upcoming events and, and things to know about um, what's, what's next. And I'd like to take a moment to talk about our code of conduct and community ethos. Now, at Fringe, we don't have a lot of rules, but we do take our code of conduct and community ethos very seriously. If you register as a project, you and your team will be held accountable for your actions as you participate within our festival. And that, of course, applies to digital spaces like this event today as well. And our code of conduct is being dropped in the chat right now so that you can check it out and um, keep up to it. The Hollywood Fringe is committed to creating an inclusive environment in the support of our participants. The festival is built on freedom of expression and a lack of censorship, which means we must maintain the utmost respect for one another to create a safe space, space for people to take risks in their work. Uh, the following are not allowed in our community. Microaggressions, verbal and physical intimidation, hate speech, uh, harassment, sexual harassment, assault, excessive consumption of alcohol and other legal substances, aggressive behavior, and as you're navigating the festival, just be mindful of your intention versus impact and also public versus private interactions. If a member of the fringe staff comes to you and um, uh, proposes a complaint that's been made, please take it seriously. If you, the code of conduct is not followed, your time at fringe may come to an end. And if you witness or experience any of what we just listed, please report it to any present staff member as soon as possible or email code of, or, sorry, email conduct at hollywoodfringe.org. And we just thank you in advance for honoring that code. And if you need to find us at the fringe um, during on, on the ground, we all, all of our staff will have badges. So you can find this very easily. All right, we are almost done with our announcements. So our final announcements are that the print deadline has been extended. You may have seen this yesterday and we are able to get some wiggle room on our print deadline and are extending that extra time to you. So that's gonna be April 20th is the last day to register, book your venue and purchase ads if you want to be included in our printed guide. If you wanna guarantee that your show listing will be included in the printed guide, you must have the following done no later than January 20th. Oh, sorry, that's my birthday, sorry, April 20th. What am I saying? Registration for Hollywood Fringe Festival 23 uh, completed and paid. For uh, more information about registration, you can visit the link here that we're dropping in the chat right now. Your official Hollywood Fringe Festival 23 show description is updated via the Fringe site. This is where we pull the information for our printed guide. So you have until April 20th, that's April 20th, to ensure your short description. Ticket prices and category are updated via your project page. 
an official Hollywood Fringe venue is booked and your shows are scheduled through the Fringe site. So you have to have a venue booked um, through the Hollywood Fringe uh, zone. An essential part of the registration process is ensuring your dates are accurately input through the venue, and you must have this done before April 20th to ensure that your listing is um, in our daily schedule. What is the printed guide and why is it important? Well, the Hollywood Fringe 23 printed guide will be nearly 100 pages of everything how to fringe. This includes short uh, show, uh, show descriptions for hundreds of participating productions, a daily schedule of what's going on at Fringe, and a handy map on how to navigate the many venues that participate each year. We print and distribute 25,000 copies around the Hollywood neighborhood at distribution centers, uh, or sorry, local hubs, bars, uh, restaurants, hotels, community spaces, and that's guaranteed exposure for your show. So you want to make sure that you're hitting this deadline. Our printed guide ads must also be purchased by April 20th. Included in your registration is a printed guide listing with your show description, dates, as well as an inclusion in the daily schedule. But if you want additional photographic representation, buying an ad in the fringe guide is the way to go. Prices start at $250 for artists, and all proceeds go back into the printing, designing and distribution of this advantageous fringe resource. If you want an ad in the printed guide, you must purchase it no later than April 20th. You can visit the Hollywood Fringe Market to view your options and templates and click here to see the size and guidelines, which we're dropping all of this in the chat for you. Um, online guide ads may be purchased at any time before the festival begins. Um, note, you may still register for the Hollywood Fringe after April 20th um, and, and the festival and before the festival begins, but your show listing will only be on our website. It's not going to be in the printed guide. So that's important um, that you hit that April 20 deadline so you can be inside the printed guide. Now, enough about uh, the guides. Just write that date down, April 20th, and then follow us on social media. Uh, we have TikTok and Instagram, and you can like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and all across the board, all of our channels are at Hollywood Fringe, and we'll drop that in the chat for you as well. Uh, speaking of these dates, I'm just going to run through our important festival dates right now. Um, the first one is that uh, tickets go on sale May 1st, and so that is literally a month away Um right now so that's very very exciting and then our previews are june 1st through the 6th and then our opening night party is going to be june 7th and the whole festival is going to run between june 8th and june 25th and june 25th is our award ceremony and closing uh night party and um, when you are posting about Hollywood Fringe, as you start to fringe and go to these events and have your previews, uh, make sure that you're using the hashtag HFF23 um, so that you can really join the party and, and be a part of the community, both in person as well as on online. And then at any time, if you need any support or you have questions, you can always email support at hollywoodfringe.org. Um, and we will get back to you within 72 hours. And we will have a Q&A towards the end of this, but if you have any questions during the panel, feel free to drop them in the chat and our staff will get to them. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can also send your questions into the comment section and we will address them live here as well. Um, cool, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you one of our tech gurus, Corwin, who has been a uh, staple of the Hollywood Fringe for a very long time. And he's gonna go over some of the basics of teching with Fringe, and then we'll jump into questions with our panelists. Uh, Corwin, go ahead and jump on, and if you don't mind sharing your pronouns in a visual description. Hello, my name is Corwin Evans. You may use he or any pronouns for me if you like. Feel free to experiment. I am a pale white man with long hair, um, a gray beard that is graying more precipitously by the moment, and I am currently occupying a dark void. There is a black hanging behind me that stands in nice contrast. I'm wearing a sort of cowboy shirt with embellishments in amber and maroon. And welcome to the show. <laughs> All right. Good. Good to have you, Corwin. Thank you so much for doing this. And Corwin has been so kind 
to uh, provide us uh, with a, an amazing resource that he's going to walk us through um, in just a second that is a quick sheet that you'll be able to have access to um, once we copy it into the um, into the chat here and we'll also send it to your emails as well so that you can have that um, and it just goes over everything of on the basics of, of what the environment is how is teching different from um, other venues to teching at a fringe venue and so Corwin I'll let you take that away and we'll then jump into our panel afterward do you would you like to share the screen or did you want to share the screen uh, I went ahead and just posted the link in the chat if anyone wants to access it from there. Um, I'm reticent to share the screen yet, but if we get to cue sheets and things like that, I may change it up a little bit. Right, wonderful. Just let me know. <laughs> Thank you. So the um, welcome to the new chapter of Los Angeles theater. This is an exciting time when we um, have returned from the long uh-oh, and a lot of things are different. So I'm going to cover some sort of broad strokes and best practices, but again, your show is different. Your unique circumstances will dictate what is best for you. Are you doing a one-person show? Are you doing uh, a full cast show? Is it a musical? Are there musical elements? These are all things that would change uh, your approach to this. So we're gonna be sort of broad strokes, and then we're gonna zero in on the things that you are most interested in, because I think that's always the way to be the most useful personally. However, the most important biggest thing, dream as big as possible. Throw it all out there, hold it in your heart, Floor to ceiling, crimson velour on all sides, eight projectors, wall to wall soundscapes, everything you could possibly think about, the biggest Broadway version. Write that down and know what it is that you really, really want. Now, the first thing we're going to do is scale down, obviously, to the simplest possible version. I like to break these down into suitcases, road cases, and trucks. My suitcase show is everything that I need to do my show, my props, my show computer, potentially, if you have your own show computer, um, my costume. And I can just go around and do it on a street corner. I can do it in a theater. I can do it in a cafe. That's my suitcase show. My road case show, that one's got wheels. That one I can put a few more things in. Maybe there's some scenic elements I like that I can put in there. Maybe there's a little bit more involved costume changes, props, all that kind of stuff. And then my truck show, that's everything you could possibly dream of. That is my era's tour. That is my all of the things you could possibly want, wall of ceiling, video screens, all of it. Uh, keeping that in mind while you continue to go forward is going to help you out after Fringe. Now, there's no guarantee that any show is going to be wildly successful. There's no guarantee that any show has a life after Fringe, but I prefer to encourage everyone to consider this the first step in their journey. And everything that we talk about after this is going to have that in mind. So keep your dreams big, but for now, we're going to dial down to the things that are most important. It probably doesn't need video. It probably doesn't need projections. It's likely you could just have the lights turn up at the beginning, have a magical experience, and turn the lights off at the end. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Trust yourself and trust your work. Now, obviously, if you want to do a little razzle-dazzle, if you want to do a little flash, that's fine too. Let's make sure that you have what you need to communicate with the people who will help you put together your piece. Uh, if you need a target to help cut back, the less that you do, the more important every choice that you make will be. So if you have only a shocking red sequined dress, and that is your tech element, that is your costume, that is the point of the show, we're going to call it my red dress. That is the most interesting thing you could possibly have because it's the only thing that you have. And that is what the piece is about. Um, 
if you have a single chair on stage and it's uh, um, it becomes a haunting of a further second character, uh, one who might not even appear until the end, one who we are waiting to see who's going to take the chair. It's very interesting, right? We have this sort of dynamic set up with this single scenic element. So think of things like that, essential, dialed down, specific choices. Another thing that can help plan to carry in and set up everything that you need in eight minutes. I believe we have 15 minutes to set up the shows. Cut it in half so that you have a buffer to make sure that all of the things that you need to happen can happen. And when adversity occurs, because adversity always occurs, you have the ability to work within that and change it and do whatever needs to be done to make sure your show goes up that day. Um, there's a lots of other ways to uh, optimize, streamline your show, your tech and all of that. And it's gonna be keyed to your personal resources your comfort level, your experience, and anything that uh, you have, you can work with friends, relatives, all of this stuff. Uh, next, we're going to want to prep the script. So it's okay if you don't have a script yet. Some people may never have a script for the thing that they're doing. It might be a dance piece. It might be a stand-up piece. There's a lot of modalities of performance that don't use scripts in quite the same way that a theater piece ordinarily would. And that's cool. What we need is to communicate with our venue tech to make sure that they know when things happen. And whenever something happens, we're going to go ahead and call that a cue. I'm going to be somewhat overly simplistic in my description, because what I'm hoping to do is communicate to people of all experience levels, people who might not have even seen a show before that are trying to put on their first show. Please do not consider this to be uh, talking rudely to anyone who might have more experience. I want to make sure that we're starting at the ground floor so that anyone who might not have seen any of these things coming gets a little bit of an expectation for what they could be. And there are no bad questions either. There are no stupid questions. This is the opportunity to make sure that you're prepared for things that you might not see coming, that you might not expect, that might be a surprise to even people who are well-seasoned and experienced in the world of theater. So every time something happens, a light change, a light color change, a sound effect, music coming up, music going away, um, a scenic change. Not a lot of scene changes in Fringe, but some people do it, and that's cool. Uh, a projection, a slide, all of that. We're going to call all of those cues. Now, you're going to want to make a note in your script of every time something happens, and then we're going to make a separate list of those things called a cue sheet. That cue sheet is useful independent of your script because when you go in to tech a show, obviously you're gonna have your attention drawn in 15 different directions and a lot of different things are going on. So having a cue sheet with your page number, with your line or action that causes the cue to happen, like say I turn on the lights with a light switch, that would be something you'd want to note in your cue sheet. Then when you have your cue sheet finished with all the things that happen in your show, you can refer to that while you're teching so you can bounce from each of the things with a few lines prior to the thing that actually happens so that the tech has an opportunity to get into it and then take the cue when it's time. Um, you'll be able to punch through all of the things on the list and get everything settled so that you can potentially do a full run through of your show. Now, tech slots are time that you uh, rent the theater to come in with your tech to put things together. And there's not always time to do a full run through of the show. I'm going to break down the time you can spend in your tech slot to try and maximize your chance of getting that done. 
if you're really nervous, you have a big show, it's a musical, there's all this stuff to consider, then it's perfectly reasonable to get extra tech time and maybe do a full run through with tech with all of your people, with all of your things and really ring out the more complicated shows. That's something lots of people do, especially the bigger musicals. It's kind of important if your show is large. And if your show is large, I feel like you would probably know that by now because you have microphones already lined up for your music or you have like a band of 15 people that you're coming into the show. Like you would know <laughs> if you have four friends that you're putting on your first show together and you're having a good time, you may not need extra tech time. You can always buy it. You could always uh, reserve it and work with your venue manager and your tech to make sure that that's something that you can make use of if you feel that you need it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in the professional theater world, we do all kinds of previews and invited dresses and all kinds of stuff like that. So it can take us months even to put together something that we're, that we're running for a further several months. Uh, you can also pre-program some of your things in advance. I'll be, I'll be coming back to touch on that later, but there's a program called QLab, Q-L-A-B, that is uh, available at QLab.app. It is free to download for Mac users. Uh, there isn't a Windows version, but there are some alternatives that I'll touch on. However, most I believe most of the venues now have QLab, and if you program your show in advance, then you can cut your tech time down by having all of this stuff ready to go, and then you can save it to a thumb drive and hand it to your venue tech, or however they prefer to get it. Honestly, I think it's good to run with a thumb drive anyway, because it's always good to have backups and then redundant backups of the backups. We'll touch on all this stuff again in a moment. So we've talked about the cue sheet. We'll come back to that again. If you don't have a script, having a list, if it is a dance show, for example, presumably you would have music tracks that you are performing to. Um, you can have a list of the music tracks and how we get in and out of them. If there is a particular gesture that you can describe on your cue sheet, for the tech to understand this is when the lights start to come down. Or if it's just a music track, you know, in the last 20 seconds of this track, I want to have a 20 second fade to black. That's something you can communicate on your cue sheet. So if you don't even have a script, you can have a run sheet or cue sheet without a script and hand that and you'll be able to communicate that. I don't think that's something many people are going to run into. I think it's not uncommon, it's rare, but for a complete dance show, start to finish, there's only a few of those every year. And I'm sure by now you've already figured out that there's a variety of different ways to communicate this. But generally speaking, most people have a script with pages. They, they're able to write where the things go based on the page number of the script. If certain things change, that can be addressed with either inserts to the script and with a little... A25, A26, whatever the insert number sort of things are, as long as it is clear to you and clear to your tech and both of your scripts agree and both of your cue sheets agree. The whole point of this is making sure that they know what's going on so they can help you the best way that they can. Um, what should I expect a space to have? Seats. Anything else? don't assume it's there. If there's something that your show needs, whether it's a sound system, lights, um, projector, a floor, I suppose a floor is reasonable. Most of the spaces have floors. It's very rare for a fringe space not to have a floor. Check with your venue manager, check with your tech. Always check all of the things because there's not really a problem if you're clear and compassionate in your communication if you are robust in your communication, perhaps even extensive in your communication, we get into trouble when we stop talking. We get into trouble when we assume, and we get into trouble when we start borrowing things from other people without their knowledge. Don't assume that something is available to you because it's in the space. Always check with your venue manager and your tech. And there's room to 
partner with other people, with other shows, with other producers, with other et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that happens a lot where people share scenic elements that are in the same space. I even would go so far as to recommend that you do partner with all of the shows in your same space so that you can shout them out at the top or end of your show, how you choose to, so that you can see them in social circumstances and maybe I'll go to the cabaret together. Maybe you all go to the networking event together and say, hey, we're all the shows that are in this space. You can make friendships with people that will help you not just throughout Fringe, because you can promote each other's shows, obviously, but after Fringe, when your shows are being selected for potential further life, or when you yourself decide, I'm going to take my show to the next level. Uh, Pam has something. Hello everyone, I'm Pam Knowles. I'm also one of the uh, stage managers for Fringe. I'm a black woman with square black glasses, dreadlocks, and I'm sitting in front of a blurred background. And I hope you can't hear the construction stuff that's going on. I just really wanted to emphasize uh, and back up something Corwin is saying about communication and what venues do and do not have. If your venue tells you we do not have a follow spot, that means they don't have a follow spot. They cannot get a follow spot for you. They cannot ask another theater for a follow spot to install for your show and take away. We are there for you. We are all the techs, we, we, we are on your side. But sometimes the answer has to be no, but is there another solution we can have? So instead of a follow spot, can we have a bright light and you walk into that one bright light every time you wanna do that thing? Or can you just do the story without having a follow spot and multiple chases and stuff like that. Uh, just believe your tech when they say to something uh, that doesn't exist that you want and they will work with you to find a solution. Uh, know for sure um, also the difference between sound design and sound cue input. And I think Corn will probably touch on that. Some cues will do both for you. Uh, well, well, obviously some techs will do at least the input for you. Some techs will also sound design, but that is an additional cost. And tech is not the time to show up guessing your blocking. Have some idea of your basic blocking and you will save yourself time. Simplify, communicate, have an awesome time. All right, I'm shutting up now. <laughs> but not for long. We'll be hearing much more from Pam as well because- Yeah, true, not for long. We're gonna find a lot of cool stuff as we go. Um, the follow spot, I wanna start throwing out some of these things that I didn't put in the document for the people who are here in respect to the time that you're dedicating to this. I once lit a fringe show with almost exclusively actor operated lights, uh, flashlights, lanterns, LEDs that were meant to represent plants that were climbing out of their clothes that had LEDs attached to them with leaves that were battery operated that the actors were able to operate over the course of the show. Um, we had a work light that we used for a lot of our lighting uh, one of those halogen things you can get from a hardware store and set that up with the venue and made sure that it was cool to plug it in, all, all that stuff. These are the kind of things that you can do. Yes, and thank you, Pam, for also mentioning um, avoid shining lights directly in the audience's eyes, especially if you're doing some sort of heist or crime piece and you have folks with very bright flashlights um avoid shining that directly at the audience it can be very uncomfortable and for some people it can be um deeply deeply uncomfortable on the edge of painful um a good rule of thumb is try not to try not to throw anything at the audience try not to have anything go into the audience <laughs> and yes um while it may take as ellen points out um extra booked rehearsal time in the space to pull off these practical effects. One of the benefits of having it all be something that actors, your performers are in control of, you can be rehearsing with that in your rehearsal space outside of your tech time and choreograph all of that stuff to make sure that things you can work out the kinks of it before you get into the space. And then that takes you, that saves you some time on lighting, that saves you some time on other stuff. I love having a live musician doing a soundscape so that they can 
groove with the cast and be rehearsing with them for weeks up until tech. Uh, and then that can be something that adds so much extra flavor and style to a piece. It adds a theatricality. And as Aaron points out, if you need to plug in an instrument, please don't assume it's okay to unplug something else already in the outlet. Please ask your tech first. I would also highlight, please don't assume it's okay to plug something in if there's nothing plugged in. Sometimes these, uh, sometimes these Edison wall outlets are in fact a piece of the set and not functional. <laughs> Um, next up, what do we need to prepare ahead of time? Well, your cue sheet, your prompt book. Your prompt book is going to be your script with all of the cues written in pencil and roughly where they go. It's okay to not know exactly where a cue goes. It's okay to not know exactly how you get in and out of a scene. Not everyone here is well-versed in the notion of a three-second blackout versus a five-second blackout versus a 10-second blackout versus a blackout. So roughly speaking, five seconds is a lovely, pillowy, slow fade that will take you from one thing to another inoffensively. It's a little bit longer. It sort of signifies the end of a scene. Three seconds, relatively rapid, also a good uh, rule of thumb to keep all of your fades to three seconds if you wanna keep the energy moving because five seconds tends to feel like the end of a beat. Your show may be different depending on how it's paced, depending on what other things you engage. A 10 second fade is not usually the kind of thing you wanna do unless you know what you're going into because it's, very long. If you can think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That has big end of show energy. Um, sometimes it's fun to do a 10 second fade into a piece if you're doing like a slice of life apartment drama or something like that. Um, you can feel it out. There's room for you to experiment with this. And the way that I'm going to pitch that you tech your show in approximately five minutes uh, from now, not teching a whole show in five minutes, although it can be done. Um, <laughs> but don't expect to get it done in five minutes. Um, experiment. Have a little room to play. Know roughly what you want and then see how it looks. Uh, for comedy, blackouts are key. You want a quick cut. I said a funny thing that it, it, it just, it's a comedy magnifier. And with so many spaces using so many LEDs, the ability to go from lights up to lights out on a zero count is delightful. So if your show is highly comedic, keep that in mind. Your punch ins and blackouts in and out of scenes, it's going to help the, um, the flow of your piece, and it's going to help with the comedy and the pacing. I mean, it's all musical, if you think of it that way. Getting back on track, cue sheet, prompt book. If you have scenery, scene change assignments, um, while you are rehearsing with your scenery, and I really hope that you're rehearsing with your scenery going up to tech, you'll want to give it probably a week or two for people to get used to moving things around. When in doubt, cut things, have less things to move around, a chair purchase, uh, a chair set facing the audience that is rotated 45 degrees. And now it's a different scene. That's gonna help you out tremendously. We only need to suggest these things. We don't necessarily need to depict an entire Manhattan apartment circa 1993, August, late August, you can hear traffic outside like it, it, how can we get to the base of that maybe a little bit of traffic noise that starts and plays for five seconds and then fades for 10 seconds to then go away so we don't have just a lot of noise in the space things like that so what you're going to do making your prompt book we're going to write where cues happen that's step one 
you take your cue sheet and a clean copy of your script, because you may have a copy of your script that you've already been working on that has all of your notes. And some of them are in pen because you forgot what I said about writing things in a pencil. And that's okay. You can always print another one. It'll be fine. But we're going to prep this for our technician, for our venue tech. So we want a clean version of the script, freshly printed, the most recent one. Really don't want to make any adjustments to content from here uh, because we're just going to try and get to the show. Keep it in the back of your mind for the things that you might want to add the next time you do the show or if you do a remount or if you put it somewhere else or if you decide you're making a Netflix show out of it. Uh, whatever it is that is, make a lot of notes about what you'd like to do next time, but try to avoid doing all kinds of different things in tech to your script. You want it to be as locked as possible going into tech. And Pam says, double-spaced, 12 or 14 point type minimum, please, baby, please. Some of us have older eyes, I among them, certainly. And um, 12 or 14 point, that's going to help us all out a lot, especially because a lot of our tech venue techs, they're working necessarily in the dark with a small light. Um, you want to keep the script as clean as possible, meaning there is the text that the tech is watching and following along with, and then there is the cue in pencil that they know they're heading up to. If it is a jumble or someone who is trying to be excessively avant-garde and present a flowchart with a confusing array of different shapes with arrows pointing in different directions, it's very difficult to navigate for someone who is hoping to give you the best show experience that you can. So working with us, also, Aaron says printing on one side is also preferable, so the stage manager can make notes on the blank side. It is admirable to use double-sided scripts for rehearsal purposes. It's less paper to carry around. It's less all of those different things. But for the venue tech, for the stage manager, having that blank side is incredibly useful for laying out additional notes. Uh, because if you think about it, laying a script flat, this is the side with my script, this side then, wait, this is the side with the script, this side is uh, empty. I can make notes on the side that is empty. If there's a part that's particularly chaotic or I might need to uh, do all sorts of other things <clears throat> to make notes of wild things that occur. Um, second step, so we've written where the cues are roughly in our clean prompt book based on our cue sheet. And we can adjust the cue sheet as we go because maybe it's shifted since we made the cue sheet, that kind of stuff. Your cue sheet is there for your reference as you go through tech to make sure you can hop through things quickly and that you don't miss anything. Second step, have a guess at timing. So we've talked about the different sort of fade directions, what they mean, those kinds of things. Music can fade. Uh, projections can fade. Uh, I would recommend building the show in advance with music or video. Um, question, do you mean the script should be in 14 point type double spaced or that the cue should be in larger type? One man show of 30 pages here, how much of it is single space as per play formatting? I think any formatting guideline that you use for play for formatting should be sufficient. I think Highland will lay things out. That's a free resource uh, to download. Um, 14 point double space is to make sure that it's easy to read. The cues can be written in pencil because they may be adjusted over the course of tech depending on how it flows. Tech is your opportunity to put everything together and you might discover that the doorbell is funnier after a beat. There might be a musical sort of aspect to things like that. Um, final draft is what you use, standard 12 point courier. I think it's, I think it's probably worth checking with your venue tech for any of these sorts of things. Um, 
14 point is always nice. Uh, it's just a sort of relaxed fit. It's easy on the eyes. Erin has something. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Erin Moore. I'm the production venue manager for Stagecraft Venues. I am a white uh, female with a bookcase background and I'm wearing a peach colored sweater. Um, but just to echo what Corwin said, please do check with your tax as far as what they want when you come in with how your script is printed, your cues. Um, at Stagecraft Venues, we actually don't want your cues written in the book you give us. Um, because as Corwin was just saying, you may find you think you want the doorbell to come in at the top of page five and you put that cue in there and then we discover we actually need it three quarters of the way down. And so now we've got a bunch of stuff we got to move around. So I highly recommend you do what Corwin said, print out a book, a clean copy, write those cues where you think you're going to be needing them, and then print another copy for your stage manager, your tech, so that they can write in as they go along, because things move around a lot at tech. Thank you. And keeping track of that stuff is going to be useful for you when you take your show to the next place. So having uh, having an awareness of that, having your script with your cues that you can move around and a clean script for your stage manager is useful as well. Um, check with them, see what they prefer. Step three, how is the thing called? So do the lights turn on when you do a big gesture? Does the phone ring right on this one line cutting off the brr, brr, when someone's in the middle of a speech? Like, I don't know when I'm going to hear from Deborah again. Those sorts of things. Sorry to single you out, Deborah. That just was the first name that I saw. Um, <laughs> there's comedic elements to that. It could be a dramatic element to that. There could be some other crashing thing. Write down the line that it occurs on, and then we can figure that out in tech. If it's a gesture, if it's a dance, if it's a a moment of choreographed stage violence done responsibly, then you might make a note that it's a visual cue, that the cue itself is on an action or a gesture. That's what we call visual. Um, write down a short description of the visual action that causes the cue and make a note of that in the cue sheet. Uh, especially if it's not in the stage directions, you're going to want to be clear about that. Uh, again, depending on what your stage manager venue tech prefers, if it's a completely clean script, have it in your copy of the script so you can refer to it. When you go through the process of tech, we're going to be using the cue sheet that you have, your copy of it, because you should probably give a copy to your venue tech as well um, for reference to put in the book. Some may not want it. Some might want fewer pieces of paper because they're already handling eight to 12 shows or something like that. And it's just a lot of documents, but have a copy because if you are working with a, if you're working with a trusted friend that you can hand your cue sheet to, they can help keep you on track. They can help uh, make sure that you don't miss anything. You can have a second pair of eyes on the things that are going on uh, so that you can get through things more quickly. Um, here's another sort of pro tip. When you're making notes about the cues in your cue sheet, you can either have a sound cue sheet, a lighting cue sheet, a video cue sheet, and all these different things. If your show is complicated enough to warrant that and you're working with designers and all that stuff, that makes a lot of sense. Most of you probably won't have that complicated of a show. So having a single cue sheet is going to help you make sure you know when things come in, when things happen together, when things happen staggered from one another. Um, so when you're making those notes, label your light cues with LX as in electrics and then SQ as in sound cue. And then anyone looking at the cue sheet or the prompt book is going to know immediately, oh, this is a lighting cue. Something happens with lights here. Oh, this is a sound cue. Something happens with sound here. And then if you're using video, the common parlance is tab number. So tab one, I fade in from the thumbprint camera. And I'm very bright because it's auto-correcting. That's my tab one. Tab two, I fade out and my projector is done. Um, 
Also, you can make your sound cues letters and your light cues numbers. And then there's even less ambiguity looking at it just in passing. Oh, that's sound cue A, or I can just see cue B here. Oh, that's obviously sound cue B because only my letters are sounds or sounds are only letters, lights are only digits. And that can help you at a glance look at that. In some venues, the lighting numbers, you may have your numbers set in advance and show up and they use a completely different numbering system based on the equipment that they have. Keep your numbers and make a note of the numbers for that venue next to it. Don't get rid of your numbers, but make a note of the most of the numbers from this show. Um, that way, when you go back to do this show a second time, you can use your numbers and start over. If that's too complicated or confusing, most likely you won't run into it, but feel free to ask me a question about it on the end. Working with your stage manager. Always be nice. This is just good for a fringe thing. Be nice to everyone. Your stage manager is probably working on a dozen shows, most less prepared than you are because they're not here having this conversation with all of these lovely people. Uh, they're probably just kind of going through it. There are some people who have a lot of experience that are coming to this all prepared with their cue sheets and prompt books and things like that. A lot of people aren't. A lot of people just show up and they're like, all right, so I'll walk over here and then the light comes up. Well, when? And there's no reference. And then we're all lost. And then tech takes forever. And then we are sad. And we don't want to be sad. If you show up prepared with clean paperwork, ready to go, your stage manager will love you, especially if it is the paperwork formatted in the style that they have requested from you. That is beautiful and an excellent way to show your appreciation for someone. If you walk into your tech prepared, you'll be surprised how fast and easy it can be. Knowing what you want, where it goes, and how you'd like it to go roughly, but figuring it out, that allows you to focus on the show rather than the process. And everybody talks. If you are kind to your stage manager, if you embrace the adversity that you discover along the way with goodwill, compassion, and friendship, people will talk about how good that experience was. And good vibes can do a lot to help sell a show. So there's that aspect to it as well. Plus, people just like hanging out with you. It's more fun to be around someone who's nice. Now, let's go through some pretty quick things that some people don't always think about. Pre-show speeches. Um, are you going to come out and say, hey, everybody, I'm Corwin. I'm doing my show from this luminous void with my magic microphone. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to tell you to turn off your cell phones and the emergency exits are to the rear of the theater. Thank you. If you want to have that moment, that can be useful, especially reminding patrons to turn off their cell phones is Sadly, still a thing. We forget how to silence things sometimes. Or in the hustle bustle of going from fringe show to fringe show, you can forget that it was turned on and turned off again. It happens. But giving people that little liminal space to be reminded is useful. Um, also, you're going to want to be sure that you can be seen, that your venue tech is not surprised by your pre-show speech. It should be baked into the entirety of your show. Same thing with pre-show music. If you have some sort of walk-in music you want to play, have all that stuff set up to tech when you tech your show. Don't let it be a surprise and don't add anything after your tech. If you can at all avoid it, don't add anything after the tech that is a surprise to your stage manager. Sometimes things occur, stay in conspicuous, concise, extensive communication with your stage management team, with your venue team. If you need that sort of triage to happen, those things can occur. Just tell them, let them know what's happened, what you need to do to fix it. Uh, let's try to avoid having it happen though. End of show. Does your show end with a blackout, lights out? or a certain song? Do you plan to bow at the end? It's most people do. Uh, have that set up as well. 
with an end of show lights up. A lot of people forget about those things. Um, Su Chun, I see you, your comment. I'm going to pop back on that when I finish my current thread because um, that's a cool comment and thank you for it. Um, numbering systems, I've already mentioned this, your numbering system may vary at the venue that you're in. Your venue tech will be able to talk with you about that. Some boards, you get a pack of numbers, like say my show might be Q100 through 150. And then I'll have all the cues within that range. Other shows might, uh, my show, uh, the show after me, uh, Ellen's show might have cues 250 to 300. Um, so that might be a little bit different depending on your space, talking with your venue manager, with your venue technician, they will let you know this information. It won't be a surprise. Uh, QLab, I've already mentioned that. There is a link in the document if you prefer to click on it. I can also post it to the chat. And then sound libraries. Um, you might not be at all comfortable with sound design. You might not be at all comfortable with any of that. You can always ask for help. You can always ask for assistance from people in the fringe community online or in person. You can also look at the sites that are in the document that I posted at the beginning of this. I have a freesound.org, which requires registration, and you're going to want to check the copyright licenses on those because some of them are public domain, some of them are copied left, some of them are creative commons, all kinds of other different things. Just double check that before you use it. Soundbible.com, sounddogs.com, which is a pay per sound site, but they have enormous libraries. And then macloops.com for music uh, if you need some music. There's lots of other royalty free sites. Just make sure that you're getting royalty free things because if you fall in love with a sound that you don't have the right to use, and it's currently posted in the chat. Thank you, Ellen. If you fall in love with a sound or piece of music that you don't have the right to use because it doesn't belong to you, even if it's the most overplayed piece of music ever, if it is not public domain, that could be something that could be upsetting at the back end. Uh, it might not go well for you. You could be liable for copyright, uh, misuse, all those kinds of things. We ran into this a lot when we were doing the digital stuff. And I think it's best practices to just either generate all of your own sounds or use royalty-free stuff. Pam also notes in the chat, Kevin McLeod does royalty-free music for use in plays and others, credit only required with a link. And I recommend checking that out too, because I mean, in this day of YouTube and um, TikTok, all these different video platforms, royalty-free stuff is a lot easier to get a hold of than it ever used to be. So go to those places and check those things out. Um, some rapid fire tips as we finish this up and get into the discussion, tech tips. Check for parking ahead of time. Parking at Fringe is a little different every day, every time, every hour, sometimes on the 30 minute mark. It can be different on a Tuesday than it is on a Sunday. It can be different on a Tuesday at 3 p.m. than it is at a Tuesday at 4 p.m. Do a little scouting in advance and get a feel for that, especially the hour leading up to your tech, because no one wants to be circling the block trying to drop off a station wagon full of 18 rehearsal blocks and about 47 tambourines. That one's for the uh, minimalist music man. Um, that doesn't exist. I just made that up. Ask everyone involved your show, with your show to show up 15 minutes early to your tech time, which would be 15 minutes earlier than your 15 minute load in. Even earlier is good. There's places you can go to hang out and see people. There are some coffee shops in the area. There might even be other meeting places around. And just hanging out with people during Fringe is rad. It's totally cool. You might, you never know who you're going to run into. And that can lead to a friendship that can last a lifetime. Um, but you want to make sure that they have 15 minutes. They have a little time to relax, to warm up, maybe in a St. Crispin's Day speech. I'm fond of those myself. Uh, any sort of inspirational speech, those are rad. Uh, <laughs> make sure everyone has an assignment for their piece of the show to bring in and set up. Don't expect to do it all by yourself. Even if you are not performing in the show, you are simply um, a director, possibly a director producer, 
you may want to do all of it yourself so that people aren't worried about it. It's going to get you a lot more it's going to get you in there faster, set up quicker so that everyone can all be on the same page of relaxing and doing their best work. If everyone has one or two jobs to set up, check, good. Now we can all be together as a group. That's really for larger cast shows. They're one person shows. It, it might be useful to have a friend. It might be useful to know that check in advance and make sure your friend who can run and get you something should a prop uh, break, a costume piece, tear. Um, in the half hour to hour before your show, you may need to ask someone to be a runner and go get something for you. Set that up in advance for each of your show dates, especially if you're a one-person show. Um, or go without. It's fringe. People are very forgiving. That's an okay thing too. But this is just something else to have in your back pocket that you set up in advance that can help you. Wait until the previous show is loaded out. Sometimes people run long, which is a cardinal sin at Fringe. Always run short if you can. <laughs> um, don't make anyone late for something. Don't make anyone late to their next show. Don't make the next show late. Be patient with them. Nonetheless, if this happens, don't add to stressful situations. Whenever possible, do not add to the stress. Uh, if you can help, help, but don't add to stress. Bring a thumb drive. This is a handy way to hand over sound cues depending on what type of computer they use. It's always great to have a backup of your show in your pocket. It's great to have backups of everything nearby, especially if you can put, if you can leave one in a vehicle that you operate and own and then have one on your person, all the better for it. Thumb drives are cheap. And most likely, even with video, your show is not going to be that big that you will not be able to fit in on a thumb drive. Here's some other suggestions to optimize your tech. If possible, have other people in your show set up your scenery, props, costumes, and so forth. This is for the tech day. So that you can work with your venue um, tech to start programming lighting looks for the different areas of stage that you want to cover and check your sound levels while things are being set up. And that possibly might even give them 10 to 15 minutes to move things around and get a feel for how the scene changes are going to work in the space while you're setting up lights and sound. That part's a little chaotic, but saying, all right, we're gonna spend 15 minutes to go right through the queue list and make sure the lighting areas that I want are good. That will how, that's how you buy yourself doing a run after those things are set. Um, Spend the first half hour programming lighting looks and sound volumes with your cue sheet, referring to your cue sheet to go through those things real quick, because you can sort of look at them without having the whole cast assembled on stage to do them. You can sort of walk through them quickly, knowing that these are the things that happen. And then spend an hour skipping from cue to cue, starting a few lines before that cue. All of this stuff, I'm just reading off the document right now, so you're perfectly willing. If, if you'd like, you can simply refer to that. Um, when you get to the end of your cue list, you can spend a little bit of time making any needed changes to your tech, but avoid doing performance notes during tech because your time is very limited. And if you go into the rabbit hole of trying to fix performance aspects, uh, character moments, things like that, that aren't necessarily tech dependent that you could possibly work with outside of this moment, it's going to take time away from the tech, the only time that you have to work with these elements in the space. There are some things where you need to choreograph with the music and make sure it works, but I leave that to you to make your best judgment. But uh, try to avoid doing too much performance stuff in tech itself. If you need a full dress rehearsal, that's okay. Do a whole other dress rehearsal slot, that's fine. You can book that with your venue in addition to the tech time that you had. Um, some people prefer it for comfort's sake, for ease of mind. Talk with your venue manager and your venue technician. And then finally, make sure you re rehearse your uh, curtain call with tech. Make sure that you do your quick bow. Some people think it's bad luck to bow before the show actually happens to them. It's enough to go out and just wave. That's cool. 
Uh, Jen Crafts, hello, has said stagecrafts venues include separate dress rehearsals for everyone, which is fantastic. Um, last page, let's blow through our tips for a winning attitude and then we can get back to um, getting everyone else in here. <laughs> Have someone on the clock the whole time of your tech. Set timers, make sure you don't go over schedule. And if you find yourself getting lost in the weeds, get back in track. Um, you can call it maybe um, uh, five minutes per queue or one minute per queue if you want to go all the way down to that. Depending on how many queues you have, break it up. Uh, Pam. I thought Pam had something. Yes. Um, depending on if you're going to do streaming or not of your show. Um, and there are very few venues that are set up to hardwire do that. And I think there should be more. It's something that I'm, I'm sad we've largely lost in theater after the pandemic because I ran some streaming shows during the pandemic and right afterwards that the audiences were triple than anybody who ever stepped into an actual live space. But if, at least here in LA, but um, if you're not with one of the venues that have it already hardwired in, there are video techs around town that will do that for you. You need to, if you can, have them show up to at least one of your techs or at least just to send somebody to come watch it or film it on your, your phone yourself so they can see what's involved with the movement where, where they're gonna put the, you know, the mics and everything in labs. So I just wanted to put that out there to think about that because streaming can still be such an important part of independent theater, although we've sadly abandoned it for reasons I don't understand. I 100%, I 500% agree with you, Pam. Streaming is magnificent and it can be a wonderful opportunity to see things. If you are stuck in New York for Hollywood Fringe Festival, if you are stuck in Reykjavik for Hollywood Fringe Festival, um, I'm gonna blast through these last couple things. Uh, it's okay to feel stressed by the process. You probably will be. Adversity occurs if you need to. Step aside, take three deep breaths and find your center. Consider yourself a cheerleader rather than a dictator. Trust your people and you'll enjoy it more. You can hold that anxiety and put it aside. It's useful to just step outside. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, now let's solve the problems because you don't wanna to get too far in your head, especially if you're not used to how complicated this can all be. Uh, four more, trust your work and let your story tell yourself. It's okay to cut something in tech that just isn't gonna work the way that you wanted. Remember your big dreams at the beginning of this process Make a note for the next time you do the show. Don't change things for this festival run. You might have the best idea in the world. Pocket that for when you do your next version of the show. You don't wanna make things harder for your stage managers. Changing things after tech makes stage managers sad and we don't want them sad. We want them very happy. And check with your venue. Stage, I'll talk more about streaming after these last three things. Be for tech, be sober, be sober of all substances. I'm willing to give you caffeine, possibly nicotine, but don't do it. It's very bad for you. It's bad for your health, but caffeine I'm willing to give you. Um, you may make other decisions after your tech or show is done, but you wanna be clear headed when you're on the clock you wanna make sure that that's not in the way. Some people subscribe to a little bit more loosey goosey version of theater making, but you just don't have time to show up inebriated to a tech. It's gonna distract you from your best work. Leave the space cleaner than you found it. Don't use baby powder, confetti, or spilled liquids, even water. It doesn't magically disappear, it magically becomes someone else's problem. Don't make problems for other people. That's another good fringe rule. Don't make problems for other people. If you are using water, if you're using these things, that means after that scene, immediately, it gets toweled, it gets double checked. And before you leave the space, it gets cleaned. There are people who make bad decisions. Don't be one of them. 
And finally, remember why you're doing what you're doing. You are in a vibrant arts festival, the largest in the Western United States, full of beauty, fun, and community. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Theater problems are happy problems. And there are so many people around who can help. So you're not in this alone. This is meant to be a fun thing. And if you are very clear with your communication, it will be fun. Wow. Thank you, Corin. You are so incredible. Thanks for sharing all of your knowledge. And I'll go ahead and just right now invite all of our, our panelists to come back on. We've already talked to both of them. We have Pam and Aaron. So come on up and we'll give you a nice little spotlight and we'll move into the um, questions part where we can have a little bit more uh, dialogue about um, all of the things that we talked about. And you know, one of the things as I was sitting here, I was like, we should talk about um, spills and, and liquids and stuff and how to use them or how to just like not use them if you really don't need them. Um, but you looks like you, uh, you hit that on the spot. Um, cool. Sweet. So thank you all for, for coming today. I just want to start off by opening it up. Um, and I want to talk about safety before we dive into anything else. Um, you know, when we do theater, sometimes there are weapons involved. Sometimes there is blood or splatter and stuff involved. And I just want to, or even like we were talking about earlier, practical lights. I think that's worth a larger discussion. Um, when prop weapons or um, props are involved, how can we ensure that they are used safely during the, the run of a show? I can, I can start with that one. Um, first of all, please make sure they are prop weapons. Um, you know, there are a lot of times when we'll, someone will, I use a knife. Is it a prop knife or is it your great grandfather's precious knife from World War II? When we do the antiques on the stage because they might not survive, but two, it's not a prop knife, so it's not safe. So first, please make sure you're using prop weaponry. Um, second, one of the things you should do as part of your tech and at Stagecraft, we schedule it in during tech. We have a fight call, dance call, site gag, all of those things have to happen during tech to make sure that your performers know how the stage feels when they're doing it. Um, and if it's going to happen with lights and sound going off, we need to make sure that they're comfortable with that. So plan that that's going to be part of your tech. Um, so that's that's for us. That's one of our safety precautions that we do. And on top of that, um, extreme flashing lights, uh, not only for your tech, but mostly for your audience. Um, you, you really should be have a warning somewhere in your promotional items on your website, uh, part on the fringe, your show thing on the fringe, and actually run it a couple of times with your tech because sometimes you can do flashing lights without doing flashing lights that will take that will cause a seizure, that will cause some sort of reaction in an audience member, and and really listen to them and take their advice and see if it'll work for you. Yeah, because we want to protect everyone. Yeah, and uh, the Hollywood Fringe uh, website and your project page has a ton of accessibility features on it so that you can communicate with your audiences. Um, and so if you haven't already, I uh, highly recommend Borderline, I would say require, you should look at the accessibility um, panel that we had so that you can get information about all of these things. And I would uh, just add again, um, with if you were using prop weapons or any prop that has any sort of projectile or effect, don't point it at the audience, especially weapons. It is, um, it's not okay. And a show will be shut down if we hear that that does happen. Um, and yeah, cool. And the, while we're on props, what, why don't we talk a little bit about props? You know, how much do you need um, as a venue and, and a stage manager and tech? Is there storage available? Um, or is it bring your own stuff and take it out? While thinking about this, I'd like to also, before we get off of weapons, remind people that a weapon as a costume piece is also to be considered not to leave the building. Some spaces, there is a cross around. People may choose to exit um, the back door and come in the front door to have an entrance of, say, 
the police officers and the detective who make their big accusation at the end of the show. This is not a perfect world and being seen walking around with a weapon in Hollywood in broad daylight or in the evening can be dangerous to yourself and others. So if that sort of a cross needs to be made, have two versions of the same weapon so that they may pick it up when they re-enter the, the, the building, the venue, so that no one is outside with a weapon that could be mistaken for a deadly weapon. Mm -hmm. And have containers for them that are labeled for what they are. And if they are not your prop, um, this is rule number one. If it is not your prop, do not touch it if it is. Um, whether it's a weapon or in general, don't touch props that aren't yours, but especially if they are um, weapon props. Now, most venues will not have storage for your props because they're running a bunch of shows at once after another. That's why, one, think about if you really need all those props, maybe don't, we're there for to see your story, to see your acting, not to see 50,000 different, I have another hat, look. Two, um, that's why practicing your load in and load out should be part of at least one of your texts. And I think it's most of them, it's a 15 minute turnaround, but what Corwin said, try to do it in eight, that's even better. Uh, depending on the size of your cast or the size of your helper group, if you're doing a solo show, everyone has a specific assignment. Everyone does that one thing they do, go to the load out area, wherever it is, as fast as they can, as safely as they can, but have a plan like you have your blocking for your show, have your blocking for your load in and your load out. That'll help save you a lot of time and make your stage manager think you're a really good person. I just wanna echo that. We actually recommend that everyone choreograph their load in like a dance. Um, and so we will actually, Joe is gonna go in first and he's carrying the table and then Sarah's coming in with this box that she's gonna put on the table and, and it really unfolds like a dance and we practice it. It's another thing we build into our tech time at Stagecrafts. So if you're in a Stagecrafts venue, you will practice your choreography for Loden um, during tech. Amazing. You know, honestly, this was uh, uh, something that is on the list. Why don't we just move into uh, Loden and Loadout? Um, what are some specific ways that other than, I mean, Aaron, you just said it. I mean, rehearse, 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 rehearse it. Um, other ways to streamline it. Or um, I know Corwin, we had talked a little bit about sharing resources and um, when blood or sparkles or confetti are used or anything extra, should you just cut those from your show? Should you, what should you do? How can you make sure that if you do use them, you can come in and out very quickly? Because I mean, I've seen, I've seen entire sets put up and taken down in 15 minutes, but that doesn't happen without work. So what are your recommendations there? No glitter, no confetti, no popcorn, no feathers. Most of the venues will tell you that. And if you try to sneak it in, it will be a problem with that venue and you will pay an extra fee. Yeah, we have a strict no glitter rule at Stagecrafts. Um, one of the things that we have used successfully, not for glitter, but for other things, um, kitty pools. If you can work a kitty pool in, we had someone who was doing a show about cocaine addiction. And at one point it was flying all over, but she was inside the kitty pool. And all of that that went flying was in the kitty pool. She could take that kitty pool right outside and very minimal space around that. So think creatively. If you feel like I have to have these feathers, can they all fall in one thing? Can they fall into a box that you pick up and you're out the door? Um, and just remember, whatever you spill on the floor, that's part of your loadout. That's part of your 15 minute loadout to pick it up, unstickify the floor because your SM is not there to mop the stage between shows. So. Yeah, I'd add too, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, corn mission leaving the space better than you arrived in it, right? And I think, even more importantly with that it is not just the venue, right? It's also the shows that are coming after you. And we uh, have stressed time and time again over our workshops and our office hours that the fringe is all about community. And so when you're leaving the space in a um, in not a neutral uh, uh, way, you are hurting your community. And inevitably that, that will hurt your experience of the Hollywood fringe because it is so much about that community. Awesome. Um, Going with awesome. Your communication. Yeah, go. You go. <laughs> that includes um, programs I mean, as well. 
Um, a lot yes. of people have made the shift to digital programs using a QR code that is either on the website or have all of your information on your fringe page. Um, that's useful for awards as well. Uh, but having a lot of things that you hand out to the audience, keep that in mind that that's part of what you're going to want to clean up after because people will inevitably leave their programs behind. And now there's a bunch of pieces of paper in the audience that could spoil the, the adventure for the next people. One yeah. more comment. Oh, you go. Oh, okay. One more comment just on props. Um, if you've realized you've forgotten something and you are frantically looking for, say, the chair that goes in your show and you see a chair backstage and you think, I'm just going to use that, please ask first. It might belong to someone else. Um, we once inadvertently borrowed a chair from a show named Three Chairs and they were going up at the same time simultaneously next to us, which meant that Three Chairs only had two chairs. Um, this was the first fringe many, many years ago. We've learned our lesson. Um, but so you just never know what that prop is for. So even if you're in a single venue area, please ask the tech first, because if something happens to that prop and it's not yours, you're potentially harming another show. So don't just randomly grab things if you forgot something. This is related exactly to what you were saying. Some venues, um, prop pieces, they'll let you store big pieces on the caveat that other shows can use it. So if you communicate with your tech and venue manager and each other, um, uh, and that can speed up your loadout because, okay, you have the bed for this one show. Another, the show right after you needs to turn the bed into the couch. Can they use it? Yes, then leave it on the stage. You do not have to take it out. You know, the next group will take it out. So that, not a lot of venues do that shared resources, but the ones that have the room, they do. But yeah, you gotta ask. You gotta ask and make that clear upfront. Yeah, and your relationships with your uh, venue and your tech and, and stage managers are so essential. Um, they are the the kindest people. I mean, we have some of the nicest people just sitting right here. But across the board, uh, the Hollywood fringe uh, tech experts that we have and and venue uh, runners. I mean, they are they want you to have a successful show. They have experience, so communicate with them, treat them kindly, bring them coffee <laughs> during tech if you want, <laughs> you know, a little bit of bribe and, and, and loving on them never, never hurt. And it'll help just make the relationship um, more, more better. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, tech rehearsal. So we did have a question um, pop up in the chat. And so we'll answer this first and then just kind of move into what is your um, just, you know, blanket advice on how do you have a smooth tech um would you recommend from a, one of our uh, participants here today would you recommend renting a hollywood fringe venue for all rehearsals as well if you're on a very low budget is it acceptable to do early rehearsals in unconventional spaces or even outside in the park absolutely one of my favorite shows from a few years ago the guy with the giant bug flea he did all of his rehearsals before his tech he went up to the roof of his apartment. He got the measurements of our stage. He went up to the roof of his apartment building. He got some spray paint. He made a, a space exactly the shape and size of our stage and marked where the entrances and the doors are and rehearsed for weeks, apparently. Then when he showed up at Tech, everything, I, was, I, was, I couldn't believe it except for he didn't have a sound valve because he didn't listen to me, but that was easy to fix. But it was just perfect. His Tech went like that. So if you can, but you know, if you have the money, sure, do your, most of the time you're just gonna get one tech. But if you have the money for extra rehearsals and stuff in your venue, do that. But there's nothing wrong with finding an unconventional, affordable way to do it. Yeah, I 100% that. Absolutely agree with that. Um, if you do want time in your venue though, contact them now because they're probably all filling up. So if you're thinking I'm going to do my last month of rehearsals in my venue, please reach out to them today because that yeah. may or may not be possible. And Definitely. Jen mentions in the chat, you probably won't rehearsing. You probably won't be rehearsing tech in your venues before tech. So for that purpose, honestly, I don't think you should. I think um, visiting the space, getting a feel for the acoustics, perhaps great it's usually a bit much to have your entire cast come in and see the space during your visit as well. Um, if it's that necessary, then talk with your venue manager. 
but um, a lot of the stuff you can pre-program like uh, QLab sounds and having the opportunity to rehearse with that in advance is useful. Also, a lot of MacBooks will plug into a TV using a um, adapter, whether it, this one, I actually have an HDMI out so I can just plug it into a TV and show people what I'm thinking for video stuff. But um, all of that kind of thing, you can set up in advance in QLab and be a little bit more ambitious with your tech because you've gotten that out of the way and rehearse with it in advance. Speaking of QLab, and sound files, video files, still files, you know, waiting until two hours before your tech starts to get those files together, you know, to, to put your thing together is really not a good idea. If you could give your, especially if you're not doing it yourself and you're expecting your tech to put it in and most of us can, but you know, it takes a few minutes. So if you wait until the start of your tech to show up with, here are all my sound files, and some of them are an MP3 and some of them are in black and you'll have to convert them all and put them all in. That's going to take time out of your actual tech. You have to put it all together before you can start to do anything. I mean, you can set up and everything, but if you show up with like 50 cues and every 10 minutes, every four minutes, are we ready? Are we ready? Why can't we go? Well, that's because of your poor planning. So mm. work it out. Remember, we have to do stuff before you can do stuff and talk to your techs and they'll probably give you an idea of, how much time they would need if, if it involves more than just loading in, if they have to search for it themselves, if they have to design it versus input it, but just block that into your planning, if that yeah. makes sense. Prepare, prepare, prepare. I would add to that, that music sounds are not a Spotify playlist. It's not an Apple playlist. Um, it's a file. It's a downloaded file. Um, so please don't come in with, here's my Spotify link, because we can't, we can't do anything with that. Um, so and if it's, it's just going to slow us down. Yeah. If it's on um, Spotify, you probably shouldn't be using it anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's a good, a good call out as well. Corwin posted a lot of great links and Pam as well for some royalty free options, things you can purchase, but another good call out. If it's on one of those lists, those playlists, it's probably not legal to use. So also think about that as well. Um, and if um, you are bringing in files for us to use, please label them. A lot of times, especially with projections, with photos, when you download something, you save it, it gets that crazy long number letter combination. If you can go through and save those as page one doorbell, page one Aunt Marie photo, right? Then when we're putting them in, we're right with you. And we don't have to be looking at these little icons going, is that Aunt Marie? Is that Aunt Marie? I can't tell, right? That's just gonna save us time if you label them correctly for us. Yeah, and you know, reiterating again, even just here, I mean, everyone uh, works at different venues, right? And so each venue has different uh, capacities. Um, so check in with your venue. If you have sound cues, if you have lighting cues, ask what you have. Do they have LEDs? Do they only have Brunels? What is it? What are the, your resources? What's the sound system requirements and plugins? Um, because the more that you know, the better that you can prepare and the better that your tech um, person is going to feel knowing that you've already had a conversation and that you have a mutual understanding. So that communication is clear and understand that each venue is different. Um, awesome. Really, really great advice, y'all. Um, let's jump in. We had a question from uh, somebody in the chat we can answer real quick. Um, do most venues like to have the music cues as MP3s? And for slideshows, is it JPEG files? What is the, what's... What you mean slideshows? You're not talking about uh, the whole machine. Probably, Project right? Oh, okay. Yeah. If most venues are using QLab, right, Corwin? We're all using QLab. So JPEGs, MP3s will, will convert, but a lot of the AF would be better. I don't know. You should answer that. I'm going to shut up. Um, it used to be disencouraged to use MP3s for QLab, but since QLab 4, that seems to have gone away. Um, <laughs> The process, there's a lot of under the hood stuff I won't bore you with, but um, it, MP3s tend to work fairly well. Some people, some venues have their own specific preferences, but 
you can convert MP3s to AIFF files. Um, there is a scientific and audio file reason why you would want them in AIFF instead of MP3, but functionally you will survive. It'll be okay. And then the same thing with JPEGs. However, when it comes to video, unless you are already a professional, and if I can say the word H264 codec to you and you follow, leave it behind. If, if I can tell you ProRes 4444 is what QLab prefers and do your best work to make sure that it's either ProRes 4444 if you're using Alpha Channel or 422 LT, just to make sure that it's less of a impact on the GPU. If any of that made sense to you, you have my sign off. But if that all sounded like Greek, uh, we'll run away from video. It will consume <laughs> the entirety of your tech and life, and you will never finish teching your show. And most of you do not need video for your shows. You really don't. You really, really, really don't. You don't. I see you, Nancy. Um, yeah, slideshows. It is. Uh, it is an ism of the. Um, it is. It is an aesthetic of the one-person show. For example, I'm even framed in my video as though I'm doing a new show. And then I can present Kroger Big K Cola, not a sponsor, in this obvious area that graphics would go. I watch a lot of YouTube, so I kind of default to that. But um, unless you're getting a big punch from the joke or you're using it as a mnemonic device to follow along so that you don't lose track of your, um, your show, which is fine. Not everyone can put a whole one person show in their head and get through it every time. Um, that's going to get in your way and upstage you more than you being a rad person doing your presentation, etc. cetera. Um, it's not impossible. And there are tutorials extensively online for QLab um, accessible through the app, but also on YouTube and so forth and on their webpage. Um, I recommend programming your slideshow in advance, drag and drop, fade up, fade down, play with it on your own. And you'll know how much you can get away with if you do all of it in advance and you've been rehearsing with it. Because the other thing is when you have things that are broadcast behind you that are projected behind you, if you suddenly go up on a line and you're supposed to mention Big K Cola, but you're already on to the next part, which is my strange cup of tea. Um, and the big K Cola's up there, but you're on the T thing. Now the audience is like, oh, there's been a mistake. Someone forgot to talk about the big K Cola, which is <laughs> now surprisingly probably should be sponsoring this feed. But it can get you into more trouble than you can get out of easily yourself. And so it just complicates a process. I recommend not doing it unless you build it yourself and really get used to it. Um, and there's a question, do we need to provide our own QLab license for our venue? Generally speaking, no. There shouldn't be a license that you have to pay for. The only reason to buy uh, a license is if you're going to enable your computer to run QLab for your shows for the rest of your life or the computer's life anyway. Um, you can rent to own QLab licenses, if there's something that you um, need to use, whether it's OSC, video, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to throw any venue under the bus that doesn't have a video license, but also has projectors, but that seems fishy to me. <laughs> and I think that's, that's again, one of those situations where um, a lot of uh, what, what does the venue have? What can the venue provide? Do they provide QLab? Do they do QLab for you? There are venues at Hollywood Fringe who do not provide QLab for you. And that is something that you do have to bring. There are venues that do have QLab and they're there for you, right? And they're there with experts to help you in some, it, it all depends. And so the, uh, the answer to that question is really talk to your venue. And that really comes down to it. And Ellen did put something um, pretty important in the chat right now, as we are getting through uh, the that, <laughs> what do you call it? The, uh, the guide 
uh, the venues are working hard to get the guide put through too. Um, and so they might be a little bit slower to respond, but they'll get back to you um, soon. So no worries, but just ask, uh, ask your venue and give them some time to get back to you because they're running a ton of shows. They're, they're responding to a lot of emails. And so just have the grace and ask the questions. Um, yeah, cool. Let's move on to just some like some design talk um, because, you know, the Hollywood Fringe is the a fringe festival is, uh, you know, scrappy and fun and minimal and exciting. And uh, I want to talk about sound design, lighting design and set design for fringe because, you know, one of the things we talk about is like fringe is your fringe is where you experiment to take you to the next step, right? That's that, uh, that's that have it in a backpack, have it in a suitcase, have it in my truck thing that Farwin was talking about um, earlier. Um, and so what would you say for, uh, like, let's start with the set. How would you say a good fringe set is from, you know, capacity wise? Well, I wouldn't think artistically, yeah, exactly. Artistically, I don't care. Minimal is what I care. And no glitter, no popcorn, no feathers. Perfect. I think Corwin said it best when he was talking earlier. If you're trying to really create a New York apartment from 1993, we don't need the whole apartment, right? If the venue has a couch, maybe you can throw some pillows on the couch and that gives it the aesthetic you need, right? But we don't need the whole apartment for French. You don't have time. Yeah. That or a Seinfeld said, poster. A Seinfeld poster, right? <laughs> that said, if you've got your act together and you um, uh, choreograph, like uh, what Aaron said, I had a friend show where they came in and in seven and a half minutes made an entire outdoor porch deck with AstroTurf, a table, a, a military thing. They did because everyone had their part of the dance and so they strung lights and I just sat there going, wow. And they struck it even faster. So aesthetics, I don't care. It's all about speed and get in and get out without causing problems for whoever's after you. Um, and uh, Ellen posted in the chat too, and I just want to shout this out. You know, the more that you have questions, you're going to continue to have questions. Come to office hours, and that's where you'll be able to find myself, Lois, Ellen, Carly, uh, Wiley, all of our fringe staff. And we're happy to um, check in with you, give you answers. And then the best part is a lot of our, our venue managers and, and um, representatives go to office hours. So that's a great time to go there and talk to them so that you can get this information that you have. And we had um, a, a tech meeting a while back for our scholarship shows. And one of the things that um, the tech person for the venue had said that I, I absolutely love that I want to share here is, you know, when you were, let's talk about this New York apartment, um, blocks and simple tables. If you set up a block and you say, this is the couch, the audience will dispend their belief to believe that that is the couch and this is the kitchen nook. And they won't bat an eyelash. But if you have too many mixed and matched of like, um, okay, well, we have a bookshelf and like a, a wall and a door, but then everything else is a block, then th the suspension of disbelief stops. So think minimal. People will believe what you present to them and what you tell them is on stage and, and it'll be a great show. Um, awesome. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, we've talked a lot about sound design. I mean, what just real quickly, what would you say a good sound design encompasses uh, for fringe simple simplicity wise? I've had a lot of fun with a person who has a guitar sitting off to the side of the stage. I've had casts of actors with noisemakers and other devices performing sounds of fire or outside night camp that kind of stuff i've done all kinds of music and choral pieces where everyone in the audience every every actor in the company is making noises with their mouths with their body with their whatever um yeah and and even just the those kinds of solutions that not only is inherently theatrical and kind of rad that everyone has the power over that to create this machine themselves on stage aesthetically. If you have um, 
a featured spot, if you have a flash mob, if you have a ad that you're trying to run on social media that can happen where those things are created and we look at that as a performance in, in itself in a cabaret style setting, those kinds of things lend themselves to other theatrical happenings. So when you have the ability to create an artistic version of a sound design to render a world using purely performative and musical, and I'm not trying to get Aristotelian with this, I'm a white guy talking about theater aesthetics. There are many different performance traditions to draw from that you can open your heart and your mind to and get super creative. Push the boundaries. People will talk about the, the, the drum circle. People will talk about the, the fiddle player. I remember some fringe shows where someone whips out a saxophone and you're like, what's happening to me now? This is a place that I can go to see this. This is something that occurs. Wow, the wow factor of being able to use a talent like that, that you already have, or that a friend of yours has. Someone that's not even related to the show walks out. There was a show called Lackawanna Blues at the Mark Taper Forum a couple years back. It's just a guy telling a story and a guy with a guitar. And man, that room was live every night. It was so rad. Just open, open your mind. Love that. I love instruments. And instruments can make such like, I, I play the violin and you can do a lot to make sounds sound like door creakings, knocking. Oh, it's so cool. The possibilities are endless. Talk to your musical friends. <laughs> Pam, Pam or Aaron, do y'all have anything to add here? Um, a couple of things. Don't forget pre-show. Pre-show helps set the tone. Fringe is frantic. So someone running from a comedy to your super sad show probably needs that pre-show music to get them in the mood for that super sad, <laughs> poignant moment, right? Um, and also sound can help you get creative. You know, we can't break glass on stage, but we can break glass off stage with the sound cue done right, right? So think about that as well. Um, that sound might help you get around some of those, how do we do this during fringe moments? I agree with everything both of them said, and so we'll not waste your time repeating it. You're absolutely right, right both of them. Awesome. And uh, how about lighting design? You know, each venue has different lighting capabilities. Um, so I'll preface it with ask your venue. And that is going to be uh, at the end, we'll ask, you know, a one takeaway from this from each of us. But my one takeaway for y'all is check in with your venues if you have a specific question to your show because then they're the only persons that can answer that for you um awesome what do you what do you all think about about lighting and how much to have what's possible you can do so much with basic lights you really can you know i went in a venue where i had six total fennels that's it fennels i always pronounce that wrong i had six cans and at any given time, one or two of them might be out. But with some strategic use of gels, refocusing them, you can beautiful shadow effects and beautiful light effects. You can do a lot. And with LEDs, LEDs might be a little colder. It all depends on your aesthetic and everything, but you can do even more a big range. So just because- LEDs are light emitting diodes that are usually clustered with a collection of um, different colors, which means that they can change to a bunch of different colors on the fly and typically on a zero count. Traditional conventional lighting, incandescent, heats up, which means it will have a, it will have a non-zero amount of time while it heats up to get to full, all the way bright or whatever other level it needs to get to. And then when it goes off, it will have a non-zero amount of time that it has to cool down because it's a filament that gets hot and then produces light. We use gels to change the color of that light. Um, sometimes those, be, those are changed between performances depending on the venue. Have a long conversation about that because that, turn, that is added to your load in time. Um, but a lot of venues have embraced the LED fixtures because one, you have zero count up and zero count down. 
which we talked about earlier being incredibly useful for comedy. If you dip out real fast on a zero count, it's funnier because you've added a percussive element to the lighting design that helps punch the joke. It's a punchline. Also, color changing, there's typically hundreds of colors, if not thousands, that these LEDs can make on the fly, which means not needing to use um, gels, which means it all just gets programmed into your show. So if you have a venue that has a variety, they may be called color washes, they may be called LED washes, they may be called um, just LEDs, you can say, what colors can you give me? And then the conversation can be, can it be more red? Can it be more blue? Can it be more green? And then you mix colors from there. Typically, yellow is pretty terrible, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's, a, that's, again, a very venue-specific thing, whether they have LEDs or whether they have Fresnels or other light sources. So to check in with their venue and um, go from there. Awesome. Uh, did anyone have anything else to say about the lighting? I would just real quick, after you check in with your venue, start thinking about, before you come into tech, lighting areas. Your venue should be able to tell you we have nine lighting areas, upstage, downstage, center, all of those things, so that you have that in mind when you come into tech. So rather than just, I want lights up, lights up stage left, the full screen, the full stage, stage right, downstage, upstage, that's going to help as you're working through your cues if you already know where you want those lights. But check yeah. with your venue and what you've got available. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to move into an open Q&A section at, the, at this point in time. Uh, and before we go there, I just want to add in um, when we're talking about tech and, you know, making our big plans and our big dreams and then minimalizing them, I would say it's important to have a plan B um, for anything that could possibly happen. Because we discussed this already, theater can be unpredictable, things can happen and something can break, a light cannot work, anything can happen. And I, I would recommend with your team and your cast go, hey, what if something doesn't work that is a technical element? What do we do to, to save the show? What do we do to get out of it? What are our, 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 what are our alternatives? That is a mouthful. And um, just really have that plan ready to go. So without further ado, if you have any questions in um, here, you can raise your virtual hand and we can call on you. You can use audio, you can use video, or you can just throw them in the chat, whatever you prefer. And then if you are on Facebook, feel free to put a uh, question in the comments and then we'll pass them over here and we'll answer them over here. I have one that was uh, private, but I'm not going to out the person who sent it to me. Um, the question, because I want everyone to feel comfortable about the silliest thing they can possibly think of bringing up to just bravely say it because one other person in here probably was wondering the same thing and either didn't figure out how to word it or was too shy. Um, what is a pre-show? So you will have your load in, which occurs after the show that is ahead of you has loaded out. And then the space between your end of your load in when everyone's ready you can now open the house and then the audience will walk in and fill the space and then when they're ready you begin the show thus ending the pre-show the pre-show happens from when everything is loaded in and you're ready to open the house and start letting people in to when you're ready to start the show and that can be ended with a speech Friends and customers, welcome to the show. We would like to recommend you turn off your cell phones so that they don't make noise and enjoy the piece. And then lights down, lights up, we start. But the whole portion up until my pre-show speech there, that's pre-show. So you can have the lighthearted jazz stylings of Sir Kenny G or whatever other thing speaks to the heart and soul of your show, whether it's um, Quincy Jones and his orchestra, or I don't know why I'm pulling from all of these options, but they're great pre-shows, so I recommend them. Maybe not Kenny G, unless you have a really chill show, but- um, Fringe also has a boilerplate that is required almost of every show. So it just says, welcome to Hollywood Fringe Festival. This is blah, we have many. And then you can do that speech in character. 
or in the mood of your show to help set the pre-show vibe. So that's your pre-show and that's your post-show. And that was not a dumb question. That's a good question. You guys, first time here, we're trying to tell everybody what they, even there, back in the day when I didn't even know and stuff. Oh, and there's a pre-recorded fringe speech that all venues will have. So you can just have that play and not worry about it. And this, I don't think I mentioned it, um, post-show, uh, it's perfectly reasonable to have a quick bow. And then while everyone's getting ready, you can have someone come out and say, we're all going to load out here because it's a pretty wild show. We were going to get some more shows out right after this. But if you want to meet up with us after, we'll be at so-and-so after the show. And hey, while you're at it, go see the latest show from our friends, uh, our fringe friends, um, the Annie Oakley Comedy Variety Hour, whatever it is. You can use your post-show as a call to action to send people to your fringe friends and they can do the same for you. And then you have shared audiences. You can also tell them where to meet you to talk after the show, because sometimes, especially with a one person show, you can kind of get mobbed by all the people who are trying to talk while you're also trying to get out. <laughs> so setting those kinds of expectations post-show is uh, super handy and totally groovy. Essential. Yeah, I and mean, what other questions do we have? This is a, uh... Their opportunity to ask it, uh, like the, uh, we said, there's no dumb questions. Um, feel free to raise your virtual hands or uh, put it in the chat. Thank you all are so wise and so good at this. Every time we do this panel, I learn something new and it just makes me so happy. I think I could become a tech person in the near future. <laughs> um, well, if we don't have any questions, I'll give it another couple seconds. I mean, I would say then, you know, of uh, the people we have here today, you know, what would be the one thing if they could take away one thing today from your brilliant minds, what would it be? Mine would be ask your venue if you have a question specific about your show. Um, and I also recommend that uh, Ellen's recommendation is that you include a land acknowledgement in your pre-show. Um, and if you need to... Oh. Get to Actually, it's that we will be providing um, okay. a, a recorded speech. Um, that's ha so um, this is new for this year. We've never done this at Hollywood Fringe before, but this year we'll have a pre-recorded speech that every venue will have access to that has just kind of a basic about what the festival is so that people who are coming to see your show can get interested in the hundreds of other productions that are happening. And it will also include a land acknowledgement. That way everybody across the festival has access to that. Um, we'll also provide a script for that. Um, and so talk to your venue. Um, we're working with our venues right now. It's a new thing. Um, so we'll try it out this year and it'll be exciting. Brilliant. Thank you, Ellen. That is our that is our festival co-director and she has all of the information when you see her at office hours, respectfully, you know, give her some love and ask her any questions you may have. And she's so kind and happy to help. Um, what would your last uh, like one takeaway advice be? Come prepared. Okay. Come prepared with a great attitude. Remember, everybody's there to support you. No one's after you. Come prepared with a big heart. Be flexible and have patience during tech. Do more with less. Do more with less. Yes, these are great pieces of advice. Be kind, spread love and spread joy and celebrate theater. That's what this festival is all about. Community and the celebration of ancient art. Um, awesome. Let's move into just some quick, quick closing announcements and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sign off. So remember, any questions that you have, you can go to support at hollywoodfringe.org at any time. And we have our supporter there where every question that we have ever been asked is on that, uh, on that website article. And so you can find all of the information that you may need there. You can also email support at hollywoodfringe.org to get any support that you need. And then make sure that you register by um, April 20th to be included in the guide. That is gonna be April 20th um, to be included in the guide as well as ads are due April 20th as well. So if you want to 
have an ad included in the guide, which, you know, that goes to uh, hot spots and the fringe zone at venues. It's a great resource and it gets seen by so many people. So make sure that you, you get in that guide. And if you'd like an ad, go ahead and uh, get that in by the 20th. Um, our office hours have once again begun. And so we, every Wednesday we will be at a different hot spot in the Hollywood fringe zone. And this next one is going to be April 5th. That's this Wednesday. We're gonna be at the Broadwater Plunge from seven o'clock until 10 o'clock PM. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Pam and Aaron and Corwin for being here with us and sharing your incredible knowledge. And I uh, can't wait to see your faces and to do this festival that's happening in two months. It's happening now, really. It's like it is happening currently. So thank you all so much. You have a great Sunday. Happy, happy, happy Sunday.